You're watching Grassroots Community TV, the nation's original community-operated television station, protecting and nurturing open channels of communication for the citizens of the Roaring Fork Valley since 1972. My name is Colin Laird and I run Healthy Mo Mountain Communities and this is the State of the Valley Symposium. So if you're not signed up for this or you came to the wrong event, well this is the time to leave. Uh, thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, this is uh, uh, I think the seventh or eighth version of this event uh, and each, each time we do it, it takes on a different flavor and this year we're going to be talking about economics. I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, Alpine Bank, uh, Roaring Fork Transportation Authority, City of Aspen, The Land Studio, and Ted Guy Associates. Uh, I'd like to thank my board. Uh, they're helping with the registration. And uh, Rose Criswell, Anna Gagne, Doug Pratt, Randy Reedy, Greg Rusi, and Paula Stepp. Uh, We've got a pretty full agenda. Uh, we've got uh, kind of a, a morning uh, of framing the issues around uh, economics, and uh, we've got very fortunate to have Amy uh, here this morning to kind of lay out uh, a very interesting proposal around local investment in our communities and how we can make that happen. Uh, we're then going to take uh, a step looking at downtowns and how place can be an important uh, aspect of our economic development. We're then going to shift gears a little bit and then talk locally about what's going on and some in innovative ways to think about economic development at the local level. Uh, we'll then uh, have lunch, and then in the afternoon, we're going to have a panel, uh, much more uh, informal than the presentations of the morning, uh, but where we really try and get it down into the details of how do we make local vesting, local economic uh, development happen, uh, and how do we build our regional economy. I'd uh, like to thank our sympo uh, symposium partner, uh, Randy Lowenthal and the Roaring Fork Business Resource Center. Uh, she uh, quickly uh, agreed to partner with me when I uh, showed up maybe just a month ago and said, hey, can I get your help putting this together? So uh, uh, great thanks to her for uh, helping with uh, putting this together. Um, just a reminder, about four years ago, uh, in September 2008, uh, the world changed uh, quite dramatically. Uh, our, our economic engine uh, took a steep dive. Uh, and although, uh, as you can uh, note, uh, things have kind of come back quite a bit on Wall Street, that's not necessarily the case on Main Street. And in many ways, Wall Street and Main Street are kind of uh, in competition. Uh, what works for one isn't uh, always uh, working for the other. And what we have today is uh, a proposal that maybe we want, might want to think about local uh, development a little differently. And uh, Amy asked the interesting question of what if 1% of our investments were actually made within 50 miles of where we live? Uh, well, hey, you know, you have the answer. I don't. And I know that most of my investments, I actually really don't have any, are not within 50 miles. Uh, I don't even know where they are. Uh, but I think it, it, it opens a very provocative question about how we might want to explore economic development. Unfortunately, there's not an app for economic development. Uh, there's an app for almost everything. Last night, Amy was racing to the, the airport and she needed to get checked in. And I hadn't checked her in because I just bought the ticket. And I went on online and lo and behold, there's an app to check in. So I downloaded it, checked her in, and she was able to get on her flight. Uh, economic development, unfortunately, is not that easy. Uh, we wish it was. But what we're going to hear today is some really neat ideas about how communities can take more control over uh, 
their, their economic futures and some of the neat case studies that are happening around the, the country. And the nice thing is that we don't have to recreate the wheel. A lot of really neat things are going on around the country and in our area, and we have an opportunity to build on that. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, ask Randy come up here. She's going to introduce uh, Amy. Oh, and we're taping all this, and we'll put the video and the PowerPoint in our Lots of familiar faces. Uh, good to see you all. I was thrilled when Colin called me and said, we're going to do State of the Valley, and we have this person, and it's called Loca Vesting, and what do you guys think? The Roaring Fork Business Resource Center is a virtual incubator for, new, for startups and a resource for established businesses. And for three years now, we've been doing a lot of technical assistance, which is a business comes in, says, hello, what do you need? Uh, if we can help, we do. If not, we help find somebody who can. That's the elevator speech. Uh, we've been wanting to do something in local investing. We've talked about it at the board. We've talked about it with all kinds of other resources around. And so when Colin said, not only is it a great subject, but she wrote this book and she has all these great ideas, I said, oh my gosh, this is really terrific and maybe this is what we need to launch an effort in the region. The, our center is big on regional and big on collaboration. So this was another thing that fit in perfectly with mission and uh, all the things that we're trying to do. Um, we have clipboards out at the registration. If you want to, we want to go next step on this after today's conversation. We are happy to be a convener, so please sign up on the list and we'll try to pull some people together and see if we can make this happen. Uh, Amy told me very briefly that she got in to the hotel about midnight and she hasn't had her first cup of coffee yet. So <laughs> she's in process and I can relate. I don't know how many of the rest of you can. So I'm gonna try to just talk a little slowly, give her a couple of minutes to gear up. Um, she is a Renaissance woman. You can see from the bio that you received when you registered that she's done a lot of wonderful things. She's into business, finance, food, wine, travel, uh, all kinds of great things. Needless to say, uh, all of that can be turned into business discussions. She's been, she's been writing for a long time. She's covered high-tech industries and it's fascinating, as Colin said, to think about the 1% shift, what a huge difference that could make. We talk about slow food. We talk about local co-ops. We have food co-ops and local food in Carbondale and lots of things happening in different places. Why not with investing? Uh, it's no more complicated than that. Her book is terrific, and I think there's signed copies out there for sale. I'll help. It's not a problem. I can help you sell these. Um, but it really does have lots of great ideas, and I'm sure some of the things that she's going to be talking about we can find in the book. It might be something, m my view of life has always been that if somebody else is doing it, I'm sure they're smarter than I am, and it's not something that I have to struggle with to try to create something different. So I think it's really exciting to have Amy kind of go through some of the options, and then we'll talk about that later. You can see from the bio in the late 90s that when she was working for Wit Capital, she did the online investment bank. So she's really done a lot of it. She's seen a lot of it, and I think she has some really fabulous ideas. So without, fur you ready? Yeah. You can do this. Without further ado, <laughs> Amy Cor Cortese, correct? Cortese. Wow, well, here. thank you for that um, really, really nice um, intro. Uh, I don't know if it was all warranted, but um, thank you nonetheless. And I want to thank Colin, not just for um, checking me in last night, but, but also for picking me up at the Aspen Airport at 11 p.m. and driving me to the hotel. Um, so as you heard, um, I want to talk today about um, a key ingredient in the mix of economic development and creating thriving downtowns, and that is financing. 
In particular, I want to talk about local investing. And by that, I mean tapping the capital that exists in our communities so that we can support the enterprises that help make them strong. And I think this is a really important topic right now in these days of um, budget constraints and um, globalization and political gridlock. Um, I think that local investing is our best hope for rebuilding not only our own local economies, but the national economy as well. Okay, so um, what do I mean by local? Um, and I'm sure you guys all know this stuff, so I'll go through it quickly, but local companies can be mom and pops, they can be startups, they can be manufacturing companies, but the key is that they're locally owned and they're rooted in their communities, so they're <coughs> stakeholders. And why do they matter? Oops. Um, simple answer is jobs. Small businesses, which by definition are locally owned, create two out of every three jobs. Multinationals, on the other hand, are net job destroyers. And you can see that in this chart here of aggregate job growth across all 50 states. It's the locally owned companies that Green Bar there that are driving uh, job creation. And the picture is even more dramatic in Colorado. In fact, um, locally owned firms uh, uh, employ three times as many people as non-local in Colorado. So the jobs stay local, but so does the wealth. Um, if you spend a dollar at a locally owned business, uh, it'll generate two to four times more local economic activity than if you spent that same dollar at a non-local firm. So this is what's known as the local multiplier effect. But beyond economics, I think we all understand that local companies add to the character and identity of our communities and make them desirable places to live. And they promote regional diversity and truly competitive markets rather than monocultures and monopolies. So I like to say that they are the superheroes of the economy. But that's why it's so amazing to think about how little we actually invest in them. Everything from federal tax policy to state and local economic development is geared towards our biggest, most well-connected companies. So for example, uh, the, the federal tax code is full of loopholes for corporations. Um, GAO studies recently have shown that uh, more than half of large corporations paid no taxes. In fact, some even get a rebate. At the state and local level, economic development, as you probably know, has traditionally meant taking taxpayer-funded subsidies and attracting out-of-state corporations who promise jobs and tax revenues. Promises that don't always pan out and then often end up leaving you vulnerable. And in 2010 alone, state and local agencies spent $70 billion on those sort of uh, corporate subsidies. And in the private sector, credit is easy to come by for blue chip firms, but four years after the financial crisis, um, banks are still not lending to small businesses. It's very hard for them to get lines of credit or um, the loans they need to succeed. Now, as investors, we share some blame too and here's that 30 trillion number, Americans have collectively $30 trillion in long-term investments. So in 401ks, mutual funds, pension funds, and the like. But almost none of that is invested in local companies. It's all in the stocks and bonds of large corporations, often the same ones that are shipping jobs and profits overseas. So if small business are, are superheroes, uh, that's like starving Superman and giving all your money to Godzilla, who you just know is going to trample all over your town anyway. So I'm mixing my cartoon metaphors here, but the point is that this is a massive misallocation of capital. 
So there are a number of changes um, and developments that I think bode well for local investing. Um, at the federal level, uh, last spring, Congress passed with rare bipartisan support the JOBS Act, which will make it much easier for small businesses to raise capital. And I'll get back to that in a second. Um, at the state and local level, uh, economic developers are be beginning to realize that instead of poaching jobs from neighboring states, maybe it's more cost effective to nurture their own homegrown companies. And in fact, there was a recent study that found that if one out of every three micro businesses in the US hired just one additional employee, uh, the US economy would be at full employment. And there's a big uh, shift in, in investor sentiment as well. People are wary of Wall Street, and they're looking to put money to work locally where they can see and feel its impact. So they're looking for alternatives, and they're looking for alternatives close to home. Now, I would add one more bullet here, and, and that's the reality of the world that we find ourselves in today, marked by huge debt burdens, budget constraints um, you know, that will be with us for a long time to come. So the fact is we have to become more self-reliant. And like it or not, this is the era of us taking care of us. So as I was uh, working on my book, I got to talk to a lot of communities across the country who um, are doing just that, taking care of their own communities and figuring out how to invest locally. Um, and I want to share just a few examples. So um, this first example is about the cops in Clare, Michigan, that saved their town's 111-year-old bakery and helped revitalize their downtown in the process. So one morning, uh, Officer Greg Reinerson, that's him on the right, was out on patrol when he heard some alarming news. The Clare City Bakery was going to close its doors for good. Well, not only was it a fixture of his youth, but if the bakery closed, it would be one more empty storefront in, in downtown Clare, which, like many towns in Michigan, uh, was feeling the effects of a struggling auto industry. So back at headquarters over lunch, he convinced eight fellow officers, and that would be the entire Clare police force, to chip in and buy the bakery. So they did, and don't let those cherubic faces fool you, but these guys are very clever. The first thing they did was to rename the bakery Cops and Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> because, well, it goes without saying. They also tweaked the menu, adding items like the squealer, a maple glazed donut topped with two strips of bacon. <laughs> And they added a line of merchandise, including t-shirts with slogans like, DWI, donuts were involved, and don't glaze me, bro. So needless to say, the, um, the bakery has been a great success. And uh, that success has spilled over to other merchants in downtown Clare. So instead of more vacancies, new shops have been opening up. And there's another way that the cops help their community. Like many small businesses, they buy as much as they can locally. So their flour comes from a family-run Michigan supplier. Their coffee's roasted locally. They get their t-shirts locally. They also support local charities, and they sponsor a t-ball team called the Little Donut Holes. <laughs> so this is the local multiplier effect in action. My next example comes from Port Townsend, Washington, about 40 miles north of uh, Seattle. Um, so a few years ago, a group of residents there, young and old, wealthy and not, um, began investing in, in local companies. So they decided to formalize that uh, arrangement, and they created what they call a Local Investing Opportunities Network, or LION for short. So Lion members are like um, micro lenders or angel investors with a hyper local focus. And they don't uh, invest as a group. They all make their own individual decisions and negotiate terms. But um, businesses in the area know that they can come to this group when they need capital. 
Um, so in just a few years, they've grown to more than 50 members. I think they might be at 60 now. And they've made $3 million in investments, mostly loans, but some equity, in companies including a bike shop, um, an organic farm and cidery, and a creamery, which has also had the effect of reviving the uh, languishing dairy industry there. And inspired by what the people of Port Townsend have done, um, there are now lion groups being created in other communities, including Seattle, Portland, Madison, Wisconsin, and New York City, where I live. So my last example comes from Saranac Lake, New York, a picturesque town in the Adirondacks. Um, several years ago, the town's only department store closed after its parent company took on too much debt and went bankrupt, which is a all too um, common story these days. And that left them to have to drive 50 miles each way, so an hour each way to buy basic items that weren't available in town, underwear being a key item. So at first, um, the town tried to attract other retailers into the area, but the only one that was interested was Walmart, which wanted to come in and build a super center. Well, a lot of people felt that a super center would overwhelm their small village and put their local merchants out of business. So they decided to create their own store, one that was owned by the community. So a group of residents put together a business plan and began raising shares, equity shares in the store through what is known as a direct public offering or DPO. So a direct public offering is like an IPO, but done without the help or the hefty fees of a Wall Street bank. And because the offering was limited to residents of New York State, so keeping it local, um, it was exempt from federal securities laws. So it took them a few years, but they eventually raised more than $500,000, and last fall, they opened the Saranac Lake Community Store. And I did a story on this for the New York Times where the photos come from. Um, and I like to think of it as the retail, a retail uh, equivalent of the Green Bay Packers. So it's a department store that won't pick up and leave when a better offer comes along or when its parent company runs into trouble. So these are just a few examples of um, how people are investing locally across the country. And um, it should be noted that all of these examples take place within the narrow openings of our current securities laws. So these laws were put into place in the 1930s. And they're well-intentioned, but they've had the um, side effect of preventing the majority of Americans um, from investing in small private companies. So the companies that often they know and love and would like to invest in. And that's why, that's why the Jobs Act is such a big deal. So that's jobs for jumpstart our business startups. Um, this was um, signed into law in April um, and it updates these 80 year old laws for the internet age. Um, and its intent is to make it easier for small private companies to raise capital, including from ordinary investors. So before that, as I said, it was easier for most people to invest in a company halfway around the world than one in their own backyard. So the Jobs Act is a real game changer for local investing. Now, that said, it hasn't been warmly received everywhere. You might have seen um, <clears throat> some of the critical press, and I, I think it's been fairly misunderstood, um, but part of the problem is that the JOBS Act is a bunch of bills rolled into one, and some of them are a little bit problematic, but the one I'm really excited about is crowdfunding. So what is crowdfunding? It's when you raise lots of small sums from lots of people over the internet. The best known site um, is probably Kickstarter. Uh, which lets people donate money to creative projects uh, in return for rewards, like um, so if you're um, donating to a film, you might get a film credit. Uh, if you donate to a musician, you might get a copy of the CD, or you know, sometimes you simply get a thank you. But 
It's rewards based. In its short history, Kickstarter has helped fund 29, more than 29,000 projects um, from 2 million people. And on Kickstarter, people are pledging um, funds at a rate of $4 million a week. That's more than the annual operating budget of the National Endowment for the Arts. So this is a major new funding channel that didn't even exist four years ago. And it's allowing creative projects to come to life that might have never gotten past, m might have never gotten past the um, uh, film studios and the record labels and the industry gatekeepers. So one of those, one of those projects is the Pebble Watch. Um, it's a watch that lets you access your email and text messages and um, caller ID from your, um, from your smartphone on your watch. And the creators of it were turned down by VC after VC, but on Kickstarter, they were able to raise more than $10 million from 69,000 people who pre-ordered the watch. Pretty amazing. Um, another example comes from Brooklyn. Uh, this is uh, an in indie musician uh, named Amanda Palmer. And um, she recently raised more than a million dollars directly from fans in a matter of weeks for her latest CD. Um, so no record label involved. And here's the thing, she gets to maintain artistic control and keep the profits. So as her sign says, this is the future of music. Um, this is, it's very, you know, it's disruptive technology um, for the music industry. But now imagine Kickstarter, but instead of donating to a musician, you're investing in a small business. So maybe it's a loan or maybe it's equity, but there's the promise of a financial return. This is what the Jobs Act makes possible. So if you're an entrepreneur, why would you give up control to a VC or sign away your house to a bank when you can get um, a better deal faster from your social network. And for individuals, for the first time, they can not only support a business they believe in, but they can share in its financial success. So this, I believe, is the future of small business finance. Now, of course, crowdfunding is not without risk. Um, these are small companies, and you can lose money, as you can with any investment, including the stock market. Um, but I think the, the, uh, the law does a pretty good job of safeguarding against that. Um, platforms, crowdfunding platforms have to register with the SEC, and they have to keep the funds they raise in escrow so they can't make off with the money. The companies raising money on these platforms have to provide financials so investors can make an informed decision. And there are limits on how much individuals can invest and how much companies can raise through crowdfunding. Um, so the SEC is currently writing these rules now, and um, hopefully they won't uh, make them too onerous. But they're expected to finish up um, sometime next year, and then crowdfunding will be legal. But in the meantime, it's worth noting that this type of investment crowdfunding has been going on in the UK for two years now with zero fraud. So in my view, the best way to, keep, uh, to minimize the risk is to keep crowdfunding local. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot of this. Um, when you keep it local, uh, there's more knowledge of the market, and participants have um, social bonds and reputations that link them and provide a form of accountability. So these um, companies that are up here on the slide are all pursuing um, uh, local crowdfunding. Small Knot and Lucky Ant are two in New York City. Um, Somo Land is out of Cincinnati. Local Stake is also in the Midwest. And we've got Fund Milwaukee and Fund St. Louis, among others. There's also an interesting crowdfunding uh, startup, by the way, based in Boulder, that's called Funding Launchpad. And it's already raising money for small businesses today through direct public offerings. 
which is a, an interesting twist. So, as I said, um, crowdfunding is disruptive technology. But as much as it threatens to cut out the traditional financial gatekeepers like banks and venture capitalists, um, it actually can act as the glue that binds together a local financial ecosystem. So crowdfunding can work hand in hand with traditional funding sources, and it can act as a multiplier. So you can imagine, um, a, for a VC, uh, it's almost like a form of due diligence, um, validating an idea or demand for a product. So it's sort of like a vote of confidence for the marketplace. And you can imagine community capital raised this way through crowdfunding, working together with institutional capital to help, for example, a small business get a bank loan that maybe um, the bank wouldn't ordinarily have been able to give it, or to provide the validation that um, a VC might need to you know, take that chance on the startup. Or maybe a foundation or a corporation or um, a city agency might offer to match the funds raised through crowdfunding. And these things, by the way, are already starting to happen on some of those sites I mentioned on my last slide. In fact, one of them, Small Knot, has um, a partnership with um, Keep, uh, I'm sorry, with Axion, the microlender, and people can raise money that will then act as collateral um, and unlock a much larger loan than they would have been able to get. So there's another point, too. Crowdfunding is about more than finance. It's also about marketing and branding and civic pride. So in addition to buy local campaigns, we can now encourage people to invest local. So I, I hope we'll see more um, local governments and economic development agencies kind of get behind this. And you can begin to see how a local financial ecosystem can be um, created that supports the small businesses that create jobs and healthy local economies. And you can imagine this happening not just here in Roaring Fork or in Denver, but in cities and regions all across the country. So before I wrap up, um, the more astute of you in the audience might be wondering, well, if these are private companies, how do I get my money out if I need it? And it's not an issue so much with um, loans because you're being paid back regularly, but with equity. And that's where the idea of a local stock exchange comes in. Um, a lot of people don't realize, but we used to have dozens of local and regional stock markets across the country that served their local economies. So from Buffalo, New York, to Wheeling, West Virginia, to Denver and Colorado Springs. So this is the old Colorado Springs Mining Exchange, which is now a Wyndham Hotel. Um, and like most of the uh, regional exchanges, um, it, it closed, I believe, some of them merged, but basically they became obsolete um, when communications technology and electronic trading made place uh, less important. And all the trading moved to the New York Stock Exchange. So where does that leave us, though? Today, our markets are global and efficient, but they're no longer supporting these kinds of local and regional growth companies that they once did. And that's why um, there are efforts uh, across the country to bring back local exchanges in places like Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Hawaii, Northern California, Kentucky. And I even um, came across recently an effort out of Regis University to create a Colorado stock exchange. So the JOBS Act doesn't... Um, specifically address secondary trading, but um, the SEC is expected to pick this up once crowdfunding becomes um, legal next year. So someday, a local stock exchange could be a key part of a local financial ecosystem. Okay, now we're getting to Colin's part. So this is exciting stuff, right? But can local investing really make a difference? If you invest in the hardware store down the street, is that really gonna change anything? Well, remember 
that $30 trillion, I said, um, Americans collectively have invested. If we were able to shift a small portion of that, 10% or 5% or even 1% would have a huge impact. So 1% of 30 trillion is $300 billion. To put that in perspective, that's roughly half of all the loans outstanding to small businesses today and 10 times the amount of venture capital invested every year. So imagine $300 billion for the Main Street economy. 300 billion supporting the efforts of the Roaring Fork area um, and all of you in the, this audience and, and towns like yours across the country. So this, I believe, is how we rebuild the economy from the ground up, one community at a time. And it begins with each and every one of us. Thank you. Oh, sure, okay. Questions for Amy? Oh, come on. <laughs> sure. What's the easiest place to start most of these community funds start? Who convenes that? Who brings it together? Um, so what's, what's, who, who starts these things? Who initiates them? Um, you know, honestly, it's usually a bunch of motivated citizens, like in the case of the Lion, um, local investing group. Um, but I think there's a lot that can be done by economic development agencies and um, state and local agencies. Um, crowdfunding will be driven by startups and entrepreneurs, but I think the most successful model will be um, crowdfunding platforms that can bring together that that broader ecosystem that I kind of outlined. So all of the interested parties in a community. Um, and that's already happening with, so SOMOLEND, um, which stands for Social Mobile Lending. In Cincinnati, um, crowdfunding is not quite legal yet because the SEC isn't finished, but she's raising money today for small businesses by having accredited investors participate on the site. But they're not individuals, they're mainly um, local banks, there are chambers of commerce, there are, um, uh, I think, foundations. So she's got a lot of kind of institutional capital um, right now participating. And I think that um, combined with public uh, capital is really kind of the winning scenario down the street. Yes? What role do you see um, governments in small towns? Um, I think it's really helpful if they get involved and even spearhead this, but I also understand it's kind of scary, right? I mean, crowdfunding is kind of like one big controlled, semi-controlled experiment in citizen finance. So, um, I like in Fund St. Louis, um, I know the, the city has been supportive, um, but a little arm's length at this point. So I think they'll probably want to wait and see how it shakes out and then they can get behind it. But um, I don't know, I'd love to see um, a smart you know, city or town really kind of get behind this and help the crowdfunding platform do it right and, and really help pull together all of the people that um, would help make it you know, really have an impact. What do you think? Yeah, and really, as I said, um, it's kind of a multiplier. So if you, like with the Pebble watch, I mean, that's an extreme example, but 69,000 people wanted that watch. Um, so then it's much easier for someone to come in, like a bank or a economic development agency, and say, oh, okay, well, we'll support you too. You know, we'll give you, even if it's, um, you know, free facilities or discounted rent or, you know, there are ways other ways that a city can participate in this and, and help out. Um, capital, of course, being another one.
Yes. Many of them start as a non-profit, and if you were to, what would be the distinction of starting an organization to work on those problems as a non-profit? Have you ever seen the model where there was a for-profit organization that started the effort to bring the community and the business Um, yeah, I mean, there are pros and cons to each approach, but um, I think there are people approaching it as a for-profit. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, they're putting something together called Change Exchange, and it's bringing together, they have a lot of lion activity there between Portland and Seattle and Port Townsend, so it will bring together those groups. Um, it's also, that area is like a hotbed for direct public offerings. They've got 10 in the pipeline. Um, and they also have a lot of uh, you know, economic development activity going on. So they're bringing that kind of all together into, onto this portal, which they're calling Change Exchange. And I believe it's a for-profit. And it's, um, actually, I'm not sure. It might be, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, and they're going to host that on, um, something called Mission Markets, so they don't have to build out the whole platform, they're just um, hosting it on somebody's site that's already, they're a broker-dealer, they're set up to do this. Um, so I'm not really sure what, what makes sense, but I think you could do it either way and, and make it work. Um, you had your hand up before. Um, the crowdfunding is subject to SEC regulation. Mm -hmm. So what what is the DPO? What are those? What how how far out can you go without being subject to the SEC? Yeah, that's a good question. Probably being tested right now by that funding launch pad. But um, first of all, the three exemptions for a direct public offering are Reg D, Reg A, and um, the interstate offering, and that's what they did in Saranac Lake. So when you keep it local in, in one state, um, the you know, federal securities laws don't come into play. Um, so in a way, it's, it's crowdfunding already because you, you're allowed to solicit and advertise with um, DPOs. In fact, Ben & Jerry's is probably the most famous example. The first time they raised money back in 1984 when they were still in the little garage, um, they did a Vermont direct public offering. And they actually put little stickers right on their, their ice cream packages saying, get a scoop of the action. And you know they raised, uh, I don't know, it was almost a million dollars from their customers, people who love, you know, in Vermont who love Ben & Jerry's ice cream. Um, and then the next year they did an IPO. So you're already, you're allowed to advertise. So it's kind of like crowdfunding, it's just moving, and moving it onto that portal. And I'm sure there will be little um, issues around the edges of that, but um, you know, I haven't looked into funding Launchpad too much, but I'm sure they've, um, you know, they've they've looked into those issues. Yes. Are you finding that uh, most of these are based around a specific project or business or group of them, and then put together the source funding, or is the source funding have to? exist at some level first and bring in these, or do they almost have to happen concurrently? Um, you mean with what, crowdfunding or any of the? The direct public offering or the crowdfunding, <coughs> are most of these based around that project or business to start with? Yeah, yeah, there's always, yeah. Um, you're raising money for a specific business, and you have kind of a target, um, investor base of people who have an interest in this and are engaged in it. So with Saranac Lake, it's the people who are going to be the customers who don't want to drive 50 miles. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, though. I guess, the, the, does the lending structure, whether it's direct public offering or crowdsourcing, 
have to exist at some level before the business can actually look into that um, as, a, as a source of growth, rather than the business idea the entrepreneur has to come up and, does the entrepreneur have to create a business and create a, a funding thing at the same time? I guess that's what I'm saying. Um, no, the entrepreneur will be able to raise money from all of these crowdfunding platforms that frankly are coming out of the woodwork. There will be one for every niche imaginable. Um, so yeah, I think there are going to be a lot, of, um, a lot of options for entrepreneurs looking to raise money. The problem will be, you know, you want to kind of get um, critical mass on these sites, so, you know, maximizing your funding possibilities. So I think it'll shake out and we'll have um, some big mainstream ones and some, you know, that are focused um, on maybe high-tech startups or existing, you know, main street businesses. Um, so I think, um, you know, there'll be plenty of options and, it, and it, entrepreneurs will figure out what, what works best for them. Uh, how about right here? In the green, okay. Green yes. So you just said that it, it usually revolves around a particular business, but I thought you cited an example where it was somewhat of a generic crowdfunding uh, entity, and then they could loan to different businesses who would request it. Is that possible too? So the Roaring Fork Valley could create an entity for crowdfunding, and then and then donate to several different businesses, or not donate, but lend to several businesses. Right. That's certainly possible. Yeah. Um, so there's a crowdfunding platform, and then, so if somebody wants to raise money, they, usually what happens, the mechanics of it is, you know, you have to do a compelling video, and, and by the way, before you go on these platforms, you have to get your business plan in order, and you know, you have to, um, there might be some mentoring that's needed to get companies um, investment ready, ready to pitch on these platforms, and then, um, Basically, it's up to them to reach out to their social networks and drive them to that crowdfunding site. And the crowdfunding site itself will do a little bit of promotion too, but like on Kickstarter, they have hundreds, thousands of projects up there at any given minute, so it's, it, you know, it takes a little sifting through. Um, so I think what you're, I don't know, I, I, that seems a little backwards. Like you don't raise the money and then give it out. It's like you have the platform for raising the money. So if people want to, you know, and if you have banks or economic development firms or foundations that want to lend, they, you know, they're part of that um, community that, that can then lend to specific projects. Does that make sense? I'm not sure we're... I think so, but... Maybe I'm a little foggy this morning. I don't know if I'm following the question. It's okay. Okay. And blue shirt. Um, well, there is some micro lending going on here. Kiva, which is one of the big micro lenders um, around the world, um, but they're based in San Francisco. They've started a program where they're taking on, um, uh, you know, U.S. people and businesses that are trying to raise money. And now they have a um, program called Kiva Cities. So they've gone into Detroit. If there's ever a place, you know, that's in need of micro loans, it's Detroit. Um, so there is a need here, and people are, are starting to address that. And also, we have um, in this country uh, there are a lot of community loan funds um, that are part of CDFIs, and they're basically micro lenders as well. They're they're loaning very small amounts of money to um, um, you know not uh, to, to entrepreneurs who probably couldn't get a bank loan. Um, so that is happening a little bit under the radar, and. Um, 
I don't see that being an impediment. I mean, I think, you know, look how excited people get about on Kiva being able to, you know, lend, you know, $100 to a farmer in Ethiopia so they can buy a cow or something. Um, we have plenty of opportunities like that at home. Maybe it's not a cow, but maybe, you know, a small loan that can help somebody get started in, in a micro business. Yes. Have you uh, observed the trend? I, I'm sure a lot of us here have been to the Whole Foods that just opened, and I noticed there's a national corporation that is, it seems part of their business plan is to, is to give, it's not an investment in a local business, but to say, okay, you can have this end cap to put your product on. That's night and day change for somebody who's trying to make a product in their own. Yeah. Could you repeat his question so everybody could hear it? Oh, sure. <laughs> so you were saying that um, with companies like Whole Foods, with, which just opened here, um, they're now providing end caps for products that are trying to break into the market? Yeah, so I'm just wondering, is, have you observed, is there perhaps the beginning of a national trend for the, for the national corporations to do the, whatever you want to call it, uh, helping local? Yeah, I think there is actually. Uh, so he's saying, is there a trend for big corporations to you know, kind of get into this local thing and help? And um, yes, there is. And it runs the gamut from you know, what they call local washing to you know, genuine efforts to help. And I think Whole Foods is probably one that helps. Um, uh, and you know that's another thing. Like with the crowdfunding, like if there was, you know, fund Colorado, right? Maybe or you know, fund Roaring Fork Valley. Um, maybe that's something that you know Whole Foods could say. Well, you know, if if an entrepreneur is able to raise so much money through through crowdfunding from the community, which shows me that it's a good idea. Well, I will carry their product, or I'll, you know. I'll feature their product. You know, there are other ways for these people in the community to support um, beyond finance. Um, and there are a lot of things that go into the mix. So um, that's why I, I see it as so powerful. You know, you, it really can be like this catalyst that can, and, and the focal point where a lot of um, people can, you know, put their efforts to help, um, help nurture homegrown companies. Yes. Thank you for your talk this morning. The one thing that my um, mental pushback would be when I start to think about kind of the question of the Upper Valley that access to capital is only one of many challenges, and I wouldn't even put it personally up at the highest thing when I start to think about seasonality of a customer base, seasonality of a workforce, a good business idea, and vastly more important one that can actually get executed properly, as well as government red tape and regulations about what the community has kind of asked the government to extract for opening up businesses in town and mitigation and stuff. And it continues at the same level for a couple of years. I only have myself to blame. Um, I've been asking at least, but, and so I'm not sure if you have thoughts about that or if you're solely focused on that the lending access to capital is really the challenge to what's going on in this valley or other small towns or if there are a lot of other components that are, are not being able to see communities see their economic potential being lived up to. Yeah, um, so his point was about um, other factors uh, being bigger impediments than capital, like um, uh, you know government regulations on small business and seasonality of customer base. And yeah, I mean, that's a very good point. And, there are a lot of things, and I'm not saying that this is a magic bullet. I'm just saying it's um, it's one way to help. You know, one important ingredient in helping create a healthy local economy, and also, by the way, to solve a lot of the pressing issues facing this country, where you know we have a jobs crisis, and yet you know the the job cre the true job creators who are small businesses, no matter what anyone else wants to tell you. Um, they can't get capital that they need to expand, which would help them hire. So um, it's kind of what I'm focused on, but there are so many other things that need to happen as well in concert. And um, 
again, I kind of like this idea of the local financial ecosystem that can kind of be a platform where all of these things maybe can be worked out somehow. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, just a couple of quick comments based on the questions. Uh, there's uh, some clipboards in the outside tables. And if you're interested in this whole question of how does this start uh, taking shape in the Roaring Fork Valley, or Randy's going to convene a group uh, of interested folks and have that discussion. This whole day, in a way, is trying to answer that question is, OK, how do you do some of this stuff? So the subsequent speakers will try and get into more details about how this, some of this local vesting can, can, can happen. And then the panel in the afternoon, we actually have an example. Folks from Fort Collins with community funded, they've set up a crowdfunding kind of effort and they can get into the details of for-profit and non-profit and some of the, the uh, um, questions they had and how they answered them. Um, we also have a few, I don't know if they're all sold, a few of Amy's books in the back. Um, and, and what's neat about the book is it goes into a ton of detail. Um, and this whole idea of an economic ecosystem is really interesting. Because when you think of an ecosystem, there's a million different niches in an ecosystem. And the way the rules are set up right now, some of those niches people can't move into. And the Jobs Act is changing that and creating all these opportunities for people to be creative around local financing in ways that we've never been able to do before. And you know, sometimes we wonder, why is it this way? And sometimes it's because of the rules. And we have a real opportunity in that the rules have started to evolve and catch up to the internet age. And this whole notion of where do you start is really up for grabs now. And there's a whole kind of you know, it depends on what you want to do. It's going to be different everywhere. And that's what's really neat about it, because it can really respect place and the communities and their brands in ways that investing has never been able to do. We've kind of, you know, it's a monoculture of investment, and it's asking one question. And now we can ans ask a lot of different questions around how we invest in our communities. So uh, on that note, we're going to take about a 10-minute break. Uh, stretch your legs, and we have Josh Bloom talking about, okay, how do you take advantage of all this stuff, and how, that's, how does that relate to Main Street? Thanks. <laughs>